So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here. Thank you for coming. You may ask, what is mind if we talk about mindfulness? In fact, if we want to understand mindfulness and uh, hopefully later practice it, then we have to have an understanding of mind. In the West, mind almost always equals the intellect, some emotional functions, maybe some artistic capabilities. The common concept of the ego is identified with the mind most of the time. We store our identity there, our sense of self, our self-respect, our self-worth, everything beginning with the self is the mind. Now, let's roll with that for a moment. We'll get to the oriental concept very soon. The question is, what is mind for? And at first, just try to pay attention. If you pay attention to this moment, what you hear, what you see, what you may taste, smell, touch, and think, that mindfulness is attention, and attention is mindfulness. Usually we pay attention to an object, to something or someone, if it's a person. And then this attention can be without an object. We call that awareness. Imagine your mirror at home. When you're in front of the mirror, the mirror reflects you, your face, your eyes, your nose, your ears. Then the mirror has an object. And when you leave and the bathroom is empty, then the mirror has no object. But it's there without an object, without reflecting anything. And with this, we can go across the bridge towards the Far East and talk about the oriental concept of mind to have a deeper understanding and better use of who we are and what our consciousness is. In oriental tradition, when we are born, the soul and the body have a fusion, this fusion is called sentient life, like hardware and software in your computer. This starts with conception and seals or gets sealed for this life when we are born. And the cord is severed when we die and the soul cannot return to the body. Now what this soul is, is a matter of investigation. And I'm inviting you to come with me on this path to explore what this human being is, rather than taking things for granted or just interpreting things from some religion, okay? Because that's when it gets very interesting. What is this human mind when we are in this body? Did this exist before? Will it exist after? And while we are in this body, what can we do with it? So, in the Zen view, we have eight levels of consciousness. The first six are bound to the senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and touch, or body. Very simple to see. We have eyes, so we perceive objects, and we have visual consciousness. So we can say, it's a room. But without the sixth, the concept forming consciousness, we would not call this object a room. We would just see it for what it is without naming it. The sixth consciousness is different in the case of each language, because in English we call this a conference hall. In Hungarian we would call it konferencia terem. In Korean we would call it dejung bang if it was informal. If it's formal, it has a higher class name. So the sixth consciousness is already different dependent on our conditioning. That's where we form concepts and attach it to phenomena. I think this is fairly clear. Now comes the matter of importance in this place, in The Hague. The seventh consciousness, ladies and gentlemen, it's the distinguishing consciousness. In a stronger form, discriminating consciousness. In its worst part, the judgmental consciousness. That's where we make two. We make good and bad, high and low, me and not me. I like, I dislike. 
So this is the distinction maker and we need this very, very much as human beings. Imagine we would not be able to distinguish between clean and dirty, healthy and poisonous, friendly and unfriendly. The seventh consciousness is conditioned by our senses of survival, possession, and creation. These three components are very important. So what do we consider good? Good is considered to exist when it supports our existence. So if it supports my creativity or procreation, my possession, and my survival, then it's considered good. If it threatens my life, threatens my possession, threatens my beloved, threatens my existence, our survival, then it's considered bad. That's how the seventh is working. And it's been working like that for a very long time. Ever since human beings just <gasps> woke up on this earth, the first sense of self was I am different from my environment. This was the first sense of self. Now comes a very interesting consequence. I am different from the rest of the world, from all of you, because I have a different face, I have a different body height, I have different likes and dislikes, and most of all, I have a different name. So the seventh is important to make distinctions. When it's under-functioning, we cannot tell clean from dirty. When it's over-functioning, then we pass judgments based on our whim, based on our likes and dislikes, based on our sense of identity. And I think that in this place, being judgmental is a big impediment. It really hinders you from seeing cause and effect as it is, even in the rule of law. So the rule of law is really supposed to embody the correct function of the seventh consciousness not just in the individual, but also in the case of couples, families, and larger social groups. What can be the eighth? The eighth is your memory, short term or long term. What is interesting that whatever is labeled by the seventh gets stored in the eighth. It's your storehouse consciousness. So again, if I want to use the metaphor of a computer, then your storehouse consciousness is your hard drive or SSD. The seventh is your controller that assigns values to certain phenomena. The sixth is your CPU. That's where you process everything. It's not just the concept forming consciousness, but it's also the analytical consciousness. That's your Excel chart. That's your word processor, okay? And the first five, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, as touch, they are your ports, your mouse, your monitor, your keyboard, your magic pad, okay? The most important concept of mind is that there is a mind or a sense of self created by the seventh consciousness as you are raised. You are raised to be a good man or a good woman by your parents and your society. That's when your mind, your self, is conditioned to be who you are right now. Yet, in the Orient, it's called the small mind. It's not a bad mind, but it's a small mind. It's just you. And the world is much bigger than you. Society is much bigger than you. Your family is much bigger than you. So what is great mind then? This great mind is, as I've mentioned in the introductory, is like your mirror. This mirror has no sense of self, it has no label, but it perceives the function of the eight consciousnesses together. This is the clear mirror consciousness that you can use. In fact, you are using it right now because that is what listening through your ears right now. This is what's thinking with your mind right now or feels with your heart right now. So when we mention clear mind, it's this clear mirror which has no number, which has no classification within the system, because this is what's common in all of us. This is the only thing that is really identical. Everything else is different. We have different memories, different distinctions, 
different senses of self and different sensations. So your sensation of this chair is different from mine because you feel it through your hand, I feel it through mine. When we mention mindfulness or clarity of mind, we mention this great mind. Why? This gives clarity to all the eight. This gives clarity to your thinking, to your feelings, to your physical sensations, and most of all, to your distinctions. If you have a too strong sense of self, that person is called egotistical or selfish. This too strong small mind distorts your view because only your point of view counts. The other person does not count so much because that's not me. That person is not so important. My survival, my possession, my creation, more important. Watch it as it happens in a family, in a society, in a civilization, or a continent. So what can bridge that? What can bridge that is actually the perception of this greater mind. This greater mind that is common in all of us, that has no name, no form, no label, no dualities. It sounds a little bit outlandish, I know. But that's the only real asset we have. Based on this, people made a lot of religious symbols, statues, ideas, names, books, etc. We don't need them here. We don't need them because we already have what we need. We call that true human nature or our true nature as human beings. And mindfulness means, or the practice of clear mind, means that we come back to that. And when we meditate, we observe the functions of all the eight levels of consciousness. When your mind doesn't move, it perceives clearly like a mirror and not identifies with anything that happens in the realm of the eight levels of consciousness. But that's our backpack. We were born with it. As we got educated, we put things in and we got things out. So our memories, they belong to us. But that's not our identity. Our distinctions, our sense of self, that belongs to us. But that's not who we are. This tag. I got this based on my ID card, but that's not me. Neither is you. How do we know that very well? If this tag breaks or burns, that's a pity. Somebody has to resupply it, but you are not harmed. If you want to change your name, you have to fill out some forms, submit it to some authorities. If they approve, your name is changed, but you, you don't change. Similar with any part of the body, any part of your mind. As outlandish as it may seem, the use of this clear mirror mind is essential, especially here. Because if you want to serve justice, you have to consider everybody's point within the legal system. We call that the clear perception of cause and effect. That's not up to your preference. It's not up to who you like or dislike who you think is right or wrong, but actually what happened in the eye of the law. Now, interestingly, in the Orient, the law is called the Dharma. And this Dharma is actually Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching and subsequently all the other Buddhists' teaching. Why? We do not say what we believe in personally. We do not say or teach what we like or dislike. We try to perceive how the world works and teach that to those who haven't seen it yet or haven't seen it fully. So that's why the wisdom of cause and effect is called the Dharma or the law of the universe. It sounds big, I know. But if we just understand how the human mind works and how we can work together as a human society, what kind of unwritten laws bind us together, then we have made a big step. What can we use mindfulness for? What are we offering at tomorrow's workshop and subsequently on any other workshops and retreats that we have? That you become clear. You become clear as a human being without illusions, without wrong views, without ignorant senses of self and others. And if you take away ignorance, you take away delusions, then the two basic human reactions are controlled. 
these two basic reactions are greed and anger. So when we have ignorance, we have greed and anger, and conversely, if we are greedy or angry, something is ignorant in us, something is not recognized, something is not clear. So these human reactions is something we can control. If we become aware of it, we become aware of the function of our minds, then we can perceive and we can act clearly, speak clearly, think and feel clearly as well. Now, how does this really happen? When we meditate, we don't talk, we don't eat, we don't drink, we do after meditation all this, so no worries. But during meditation, we don't do that. So the energy level of our psyche, of our soul, actually increases because we don't use our resources too much. We come back to what we call the Tantian, which is the navel chakra, if you're familiar with yoga or any other discipline. And that is where your energy is undivided, undifferentiated. It did not become emotions, speech, and thoughts, and sensory perceptions. And when you come back to your energy source, or undivided energy resource, then your energy level increases. That activates the self-cleansing capability of your mind. We have a lot of sea around here. Imagine that there is low tide and a lot of rocks. So the wise captain of the ship waits until high tide and then the sea carries the ship over above the rocks. If the captain is foolish or impatient and uses the wind to crash on the rocks, that's not so good. So our ship of our life can operate this way. If your mind's energy is at a higher level, then you can see clearly from a high tide where the rocks are and you can steer clear. But if you have not enough energy, then you get tired very, very quickly and easily. You cannot tolerate other people's speech, thoughts and emotions. You're angry with yourself and others. You try to take refuge in some possession or feel good about shopping, etc., etc and it doesn't work. Everyone in this room knows what is a temporary fix and what is a long-term solution. And the practice of clear mind offers long-term solution as well as a very quick remedy and relief from your own troubles. What makes this different from anything religious or scientific or just psychological is that you do not need an external point. You do not need a priest you do not need a doctor. You do not need anyone to fix you. You need instructions. You need teaching. But if you follow this and we practice together, this activates the self-cleansing capability of your mind. This is the great mind. It puts the small mind to rest, to peace. And then the eight levels of consciousness, they harmonize. They combine very well if you let that happen. And then your own distinctions, do not become judgments. Your own sense of self does not become egotism. Your own self-respect does not become foolish pride. If you look at these, then we come to the middle way of a harmonious existence, whether it's an individual, a family, or society. It is possible. And the natural outcome of attaining this greater mind, our clarity, our human nature, is wisdom and compassion. Now, wisdom is not just being clever. You know a lot of people who are clever, but they're not wise. And being compassionate does not mean you just become emotional or downright weak. It's very different. Compassion is the ultimate strength of your heart. And also perceiving the other person's mind as he or she is. So these are the benefits. And what are the downsides? The downsides is that you have a sense of loss. The loss is your illusions, your prefixed ideas, your expectations, the way you want the world to be. But as you meditate, they are all gone. Sooner or later, they are gone. Because in Zen, we do not mitigate karma. We perceive it as it is. We see ourselves as we are, not the way we want to be, but the way we are. 
That's the starting point. And from there, from this platform of reality, we can grow and develop. In Korean Zen, we have a question, what is this? This is directed to our true nature. The original form comes from Hu Inang, the sixth patriarch, who said, when you do not think of good and bad, what is your original face? And then in China, things got a little bit kind of condensed and simplified. And the question just remained, what is this? So what is this that is listening right now? What is this that says your name? What is this that sees with your eyes and hears with your ears? And it's OK if you don't understand. I can see it in some of your eyes that it's, a, wow, I can't really grasp what he's saying. The sentences make sense, but I don't understand the message. Well, there is no message beyond what you hear, but there is an experience to attain if you are willing. What I'm doing actually is not really teaching you Buddhism. I'm giving you safeguards. I'm giving you precautions. I'm giving you guarantees that certain things that you may be afraid of is not going to happen. And I'm also opening up the possibility that your mind will experience new things, unlike ever before. Because that's mind practice. So Zen is distinguishing itself from other branches of uh, spirituality or religion or science by four principles. One is do not depend on the scriptures. That's why you do not see me read out from the sutras. Being a sutra master is great. Somebody can become a good Buddhist if he or she masters the sutras. But that's not Zen. Zen continues with the second principle directly pointing to human mind. This direct pointing to human mind is actually asking the question, what am I? Or what is this where the sense of I comes from? The third is awakening equals attaining your true nature, or our true nature, as I have outlined before. And the fourth is transmission from mind to mind. That means if you wake up to the same quality as your teacher, you become a teacher by yourself. And that is usually recognized by your teacher in terms of form you know, and in interaction. These four principles are our guides that we do not go astray, we do not make up illusions, we do not have just empty words instead of reality. And I think this is where I should stop. And I let you ask questions. Your questions are way more valuable and important than whatever I am prepared to say. So, ladies and gentlemen, who has any questions? I'm curious about your daily meditations. And I was wondering how you practice your state of mind and your state of soul. What you practice in your meditations, how often I'm you a very perform. bad practitioner. I don't do much meditation, you know, sitting time. When I was a young monk, I did a lot, okay? But now, I just see the bush as it moves in the wind. Yeah, it's important to do... If you're a Zen practitioner, you do bowing meditation, chanting meditation, sitting meditation. Most people in the West want to do sitting. I've explained the basic principles, how to keep your energy. Also, we watch our breath, watch our posture. And that's how the formal meditation is distinguished from other times. You stay very focused. Focused, but you perceive space around you 360 degrees. And you keep your energy and your focus in your Tantian. That helps your upper chakras not to be in a traffic jam, not to have too much or too little content in them, okay? And uh, the form of meditation is important. So if you wanted to meditate as a beginner, we would discuss how much time you have. And then just like your daily routine of preparing for work, you would do some like 20 minutes of sitting or some mantras that catches your ears during a workshop. That's like uh, a little bit of exercise. Physical exercise, very easy to see. People jog, people do yoga, people do tai chi or some other sports. But the mind's exercise to stay clear and stay focused and stay interactive, that's uh, also necessary. So we would talk about that as meditation, all right? 
And I deliberately do not give you the package. Why? Every package is somewhere custom made. If I give you something that you cannot connect to and wouldn't do, I have done a disservice to you and the teaching itself because you feel that it's useless. So if you wanted to meditate, I would invite you to like a workshop. Then if you wanted to continue, we would discuss how much time you want to devote for that. And we would put a nice Zen package into that time slot. And then you would meditate in the way you want. I would not teach you in the way you don't want. And then it would happen. So meditation is not just the form. Eventually, when your training wheels are off after a few years, you can keep the meditative state of mind everywhere, every time. How do you know? Your reactive mind stops making stupid things. Sometimes you say something and you really want to take it back, but you cannot unsay it. And you do something stupid and you cannot undo it. You can say sorry, you can apologize, you can even repent if it's a big mistake. But you cannot undo it and you cannot unsay it. So reactive mind is very dangerous if it only follows our habits. But if it follows the correct situation with correct relationship, then it functions well. Okay? Red light, stop. Green light, go. So reaction is necessary. But a reactive mind that always gets upset, always gets angry, always gets depressed, explodes or implodes, that's not necessary. It's a very fine, almost like an alchemical process, how to purify that from all the delusions, all the false senses of self and identity and the world and good and bad, and have a functioning, clear personality, have a good human being as the result. Mm -hmm. Okay? And uh, as a kind of side note to this, until like 50, 60 years ago, what I'm teaching was behind monastery doors. The scriptures got out a few centuries before. So if you look at the British contact with India and later on with Tibet and China, the sutras, they came to the West at least 200 years ago. The first big translation by the London Polytech Society started in 1890 or so. But actual practice did not come en masse to the West before the end of the Second World War. And even after that, as Europe and the rest of the world rebuilt itself from the shock and the devastation and the ruin, it took like until the 60s and 70s, until the first real wave of teachers, practicing teachers, not just scholars, they started to appear in the West. My teacher, Zen Master Sung San, they, he came to the West in 1972 and into Europe in 1985-ish to Hungary in 1989 first. I met him in 1991. So that's how the connection started. And if you are behind monastery doors and you practice this clear path of attaining your true nature and attaining these qualities that I've spoken about, you don't have to earn your money. You don't have to fight in society. You don't have to make a living. You don't have to register your car and get an ID tag. So it was a very different way of living, but the function of the human mind is the same, just the life situation is different. So I think one of the biggest adaptations of the Dharma was to adapt it to Western lay conditions instead of Oriental monastic conditions. That's what we are doing right now. The upgrade is in process. It's a wonderful challenge, I must tell you. I would like to, uh, maybe if you can elaborate a bit about uh, being yourself and being free from illusions, because there are a lot of teaching that tells you that you should improve yourself. Mm -hmm. And by, med by meditating and by like thinking about how you would like to see yourself, mm -hmm. you became that person. And I don't know, I didn't maybe got it, what the, the practice of Zen then in comparison to other teachings? I like do not compare Zen to other traditions. Perhaps you understand why. Yes. Because it's your experience that counts, not my speech in terms of relationship to other traditions. And in terms of uh, keeping clarity moment to moment, let me give you a metaphor, mm -hmm. which is valid for me, if you practice valid for you and anyone else in this room. 
let's imagine you have an electric cooker, okay? It's not the new plastic or modern style, it's the old metal flat electric cooker. If it's very cold and that drop of water comes on top of it, that can freeze. And if you keep dripping very cold water onto this metal plate, it can freeze layers. Then one day you say, ah, it's not so good. I, let me turn this on. A little dangerous, but you turn the heat up a little bit. And it starts to melt these layers of ice. And then eventually, the melting process becomes so complete that the very surface of this electric cooker reappears again from under the ice. And if you keep the heat up, then as the next drop comes, it doesn't set. It becomes poof, like a little wisp of steam, okay? And if you keep the heat even higher, then as the drop comes, it doesn't even reach the surface, it becomes steam and evaporates. And the hotter this electric cooker becomes, the more distance you know, there is between the, air, the drop of water and the plate. Sooner and sooner it becomes just steam and evaporates. Now, the mind is the same. If your mind is very cold, very low energy, very selfish, then layers of illusions freeze on top of it. And you don't see yourself, you only see your illusions. And this, and this ice can be very colorful, but it hinders you from being who you are. And as you start meditating, you turn the heat up. In fact, one word, which I cannot quote right now in Chinese, it says meditation means heating up the heart, this heart. And as you heat that up, you recognize the illusions sooner and sooner, and you can evaporate the illusory nature of it and stay clear. Now, how do you do that? Just like I answered first, we have to do some formal pra practice first. We have to do formal practice. Without that, it doesn't work. Like if you train to be a, any kind of sports person, you have to have some kind of trainer, some kind of regimen, because without that training, you do not become a sports person, sportswoman or sportsman. So then you keep your mind clear moment to moment based on that training. And then no delusions can set in. But that you mean there is something absolute? No. If it's because something, it's, it's, it's not absolute. Contradictory. Because it's one, you said that uh, we are very different. We feel differently. Our karma is different. Our true nature is the same. This the is a simple way of saying it, but let's stick with that. That's why I outlined the eight levels of consciousness. At that, we are all different. <laughs> Our true nature, which is not part of the eight levels of consciousness, but perceives all that, that's the only thing that is identical in us. But that has no name, no form, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. Okay? That's one of the paradoxes we need to live with intellectually. And as you experience it, you come to terms with it. This is the way things are equals suchness. It's another Zen concept. So the world is neither good nor bad, not for you nor against you. The world is just like this. How you experience it depends on you. What kind of position you take, whether you board the train or stand in front of the train, makes a big difference. My goal, for instance, when I was coming to this session is trying to find a way to, as I understood from you, to try and focus better, to try and clear your mind sometimes to be able to use your, well, use, not only your senses, but also your, your skills in a better way, in a more sure. efficient way. Practical. So that's, that's, that's my basic goal. Um, apart from having a good time and understanding everything. Fair enough, yeah. <laughs> um, so I understand that basically the practice you need is meditation to be able to, to, to acquire these skills. And also, according to what you just said, that was interesting, after a while maybe, not just meditation, you can even not skip, but move to another phase, which is just trying to, once you have acquired the skills, not just only use meditation, but just focusing on some other things or some other way, just acquiring that clarity without meditation as well. No? I yeah. understand. And, it's and, possible, yeah. but still, we cannot discount formal practice for many, many years, but we can make significant improvements in terms of our starting time. Go ahead. Okay. Now, my, my second question was, um, I haven't practiced much, much but uh, yoga 
is it also a part of this practice or is it is it like com complementary meditation? It can meditation be practiced or? together, but it's not integral part of Zen. The northern transmission line goes northwest and northeast uh, from classical Buddhism's point of view. When Shakyamuni Buddha was teaching 2,500 years ago, then the teaching uh, was taken to many countries, but slowly. One was the northern transmission line, the other was the southern. The northern went to Nepal, Bhutan, Tibet, and Mongolia. That's the Hinduism-based Buddhism called Vajrayana. The northeast went to China, Korea, Japan. That's the Zen tradition. The Jhana, Channa, Chan, Son, or Zen tradition. Why? Because that's where it met Taoism and Confucianism. So Taoism, and Buddhism together, that's Zen. Some people may not be aware of this historical fact, but one of the best combinations or synergies of two totally independent and complete traditions like Taoism and Buddhism is Zen. That's why it tastes different from the rest of the Buddhist tradition. Also, it has a big Confucianist effect, which is correct social order. Confucianism was not religion-based. It was ancestor worship based and filial duty. I'm simplifying because we don't have all day. But in terms of Confucianist norms, you can believe anything. You can believe anything about transcendental values, yourself, religion, etc. as long as you do your duty as a person in your own social context. So if you're a husband, you have to do your husband's duty. If you're a father, you have to do your father's duty. If you're a boss, you have to be a good boss. If you are an assistant, you have to be a good assistant and relate to your boss correctly. So Confucianism is about relationships within society so that society would function correctly. It's not a religious social ideology. Within that, everything was possible. But if you did not follow the correct rules, thus the law, then you were outlawed whether you were religious or not, whether you were Buddhist, Taoist, Shintoist, whatever. So that Confucianist element in Buddhism, in traditional Chinese, Korean, and Japanese Buddhism cannot be discounted. It's actually very strong. But we can distinguish that very clearly. Why am I saying that? Yoga was not part of any of this, but it can be practiced together with our meditation. So yoga is integral of uh, Hinduism, original Indian culture, the most kind of recent, hundreds of years old appearance is the Vedanta, okay? It's been in existence for actually thousands of years. So yoga is not Buddhism or not Zen. You can practice that side by side. And just the last one, uh, quickly. I understand that this, this practice can also be taught to kids, to children, but probably in a, in a, in different, a different way. way. And with different You're not the first, you can imagine, yeah. to ask this question from me. And I always say, do not teach Zen to kids unless they ask for the form. You know, let's say mom and dad, sometimes mom, but sometimes mom and dad together, they meditate in the morning. Kids are still asleep. One of them wakes up, curls up in your lap, not asking any question. You just meditate and the kid is with you. That's not the time to teach because the kid experiences Zen through the parental intimacy. That's all that is necessary at that point, because, because your child is five years old. Later on, as you meditate more, the kid turns like nine, ten, starts asking real questions about your life, about his or her life. Then you can talk about meditation. So wait until the question comes, if it concerns the form of Zen or the thought of Zen. But even before that, you can teach the Zen view or the Zen spirit or the Zen experience but not through formal meditation because children don't like constraints. They don't sit for 20 minutes when they are four or five years old, not even 10 minutes. What you need to do is play the correct games with them, children's games, games that actually teach them the right thing, the right function, the right outcome. Take them to the right places to experience, let's say, nature, that they would somehow attain that the way nature functions is the way we function. So teach them Zen without the form of Zen. And when they are old enough, 
then they will be interested in more. Because you did your job. You, did not in, you didn't enforce your views on the kid, but answer their questions. It's the toughest one. Many of you are parents here. How many times did your kid just corner you with one question from point blank range? Where did that question come from? You didn't know. You had no idea how to answer. Now, if you practice meditation, that prepares you for this intuitive answer, which may not be the best informed answer, but is the most loving, the most compassionate, and also the wisest without being clever. So connecting to the children's mind, attaining their true situation and their needs, that's possible through Zen practice. And when they ask for it, then teach the form, not before. When you spoke about your meditation, you mentioned about the work with chakras and how you attain balance between mm -hmm. the different chakras. Yes, that's, that's one of the objectives. <laughs> That's why it's, yeah, I thought maybe it is too detailed question to ask how you obtain the balance, how you actually balance all the chakras in your meditation. It's a very good question. It's not too detailed. It's the right question. So we have this navel chakra here where we hold our hand position when we meditate formally. This is the place where your energy and your consciousness are not differentiated. This is the, uh, the one which is in the Japanese culture specified as the key energy well, chakra. Well, the key in Chinese also qi, in Sanskrit if you practice yoga, prana, okay? So this is the undifferentiated part. There is qi everywhere, otherwise you would die. But here your qi becomes emotions, here your qi becomes speech, here it becomes thinking, here it becomes seeing, here it becomes hearing, etc. This is pure electricity versus your microwave oven, your mobile telephone, your computer, etc., etc. It's undifferentiated. And that's when you go back to the source. In fact, that's when your energy, in Korean, wongi, original energy, corrects to daegi, which is the great energy of this universe. What's the medium? How do you connect? You watch your breath called kongi empty energy. So when Wongi, original, combines with Degi, the great one, through breathing, Kongi, it becomes unified energy called Hapki. And that's where Hapkido comes from in Korean or Aikido in Japanese. So this harmonized energy means you are connected to the universe. This is not just a repository, it's a connection. And that's why when you meditate, you actually become stronger. That's what I described earlier as a higher energy level or the high tide in the sea where the captain can be wise to sail over the rocks. So you can see your own mind, you can see your own karma and you don't have to collide with it. And then you keep your direction clear. So your question is actually very good. You focus your attention here all the time. That's the key, whether you meditate, like this, or fly an airplane like I did this morning, okay? Or you do your job, or you do your computing, or even when you talk to people, or listen to other people. So if you focus here, then the perception is really like a clear mirror. You don't interfere with your own things. You actually listen to someone, and you know what? They appreciate it very much. And people feel that you really listen to them, there is a sense of understanding unlike anything else. Because you do not only listen to their words, you listen to their hearts. You perceive their minds. You feel their vibes. I'm just giving you a lot of clues, okay? And that's the key to real human connection. That's why the center is so important. Because this mind is unmoving, unhindered, unobstructed, okay? Thank you for this explanation. So Welcome. <laughs> Not too complicated? Uh, well, basically from what I understood, it's connection of the, of the key energy chakra mm -hmm. through the breath with the external yes, energy. Yes, that's why in and any grounded. meditation technique, we watch the breath. Whether the meditation technique is a mantra or a question or some other schools, they visualize an object, we don't. You watch your breath. It's a key point. Otherwise, your internal world 
and the external world becomes separated. Sometimes we get caught up in our own movie theater. Okay? And sometimes we, we watch TV instead of meditating and staying clear and one. If you just watch your own movies inside, then it's just a show and not real meditation. I, I believe you mentioned that you get balance with all the chakras. Exactly. Your heart chakra. This is the unmoving part. Chakra. Like when you have a kid and you want to lift that kid, you actually, you know, raise the kid through this part, you know, not by the limbs, mm -hmm. least of all the head, but by the little stomach. And that's, mm -hmm. that's fine. Then no crying, no problem. So that's physical balance. But later on, as we become adults, these problem-ridden adults with our own complications. You need balance. And this unmoving mind, this center, is your balance. Because whatever happens up here, it doesn't move. Sometimes you have these dolls, you know, in the toy shops, where they have a magnetic reinforced metal bottom. And then you can hit the top, and it comes back. So when you have a strong center, you can do that. And it's very important because if you go into a shock or an explosion or an implosion of yourself, it's very hard to put yourself back together. So it's not necessary to explode or implode, to become a maniac or become depressive. It's not necessary. You can prevent that. Another side effect, talking about balance, is that if you have your center here, then your key always travels down in the front part of the body. And most of our immediate shocks, like a heart attack or a stroke, come from the opposite, when the chi rises in the front part of the body, because some emotions got that up here, or some thoughts got that up here. This rising chi is such an important concept that the Koreans have a separate word for it, called sanggi rising or high chi. It's very dangerous. That's when you get sick. That's when you get a stroke. That's when you get a heart attack or an ulcer. This is also a chakra, just a secondary chakra here. So keep your energy down here. Don't let it rise in the front part of the body just because you opened an email or you read your SMS, whatever, and you have a strong emotional shock. You do not have to injure yourself or others. Prevent that. Talk about reactive mind, as I have talked before. Think about that. And that's why we keep it clear and we keep it centered. Thank you very much You're for welcome. this explanation. Speak up. You are Buddhist, yes? No. No? I'm not Buddhist. So, you are Zen? No, I'm not Zen. <laughs> okay. Do you follow a religion? Least of all would I follow any religion. I'm not okay. religious. Okay, no, it's just to understand if anyone or religious may as well misconcept I thought you were Buddhist. No, I'm not. To see who can actually, how it's a mindfulness. Is anyone can teach that? This come from no. religion? You have what to have a teacher who also had a teacher who also had a teacher of meditation. And that doesn't depend on religion or isms or anything in the past, just on one thing the teaching lineage. So the teaching lineage must be continuous and unbroken. And then if you get enough practice, then you can be appointed as a meditation teacher. Um, how do you know? Because you probably know by this point, mindfulness is very, let's say, trendy or... It's trendy. How other do you know if other schools right? also use it. But if somebody wants to become a teacher of anything, first you have to serve that particular teacher who teaches you. And how do I know you are the good one, the good teacher? You don't. Um. You try me and decide. Well, and that means... Well, I don't know we, what you expect. If you want to practice with me, you don't expect anything. That's why I'm not an ism or an ist, okay? Okay. You want to really attain clarity? You can try this one. You don't like it? Go somewhere else. No problem. Ah, okay. No, okay. no grudges. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Here. When um, you're talking about meditation and uh, talking about connecting uh, in the meditation, what exactly do you mean, like, uh, if you're in a room meditating alone? What is connecting? 
Well, let's talk about when you're not alone, because then you connect to someone or something. When you meditate in the room, it's like cleaning your car. When you take your car to the car cleaner, it's not in road traffic. That's when all these brushes and sponges and the sprays, they go all over your car, becomes clean. We actually meditate in groups. People meditate at home alone, of course, sometimes in solo retreats if it's longer. But it's not the testing ground for being connected. It's the cleansing and the reinforcing part. Connection comes when another human being is in the room. That's when it begins. Or you're in a group of humans. How well do you hear the other person? How well do you see the other person? How well do you feel the emotions of that person or perceive the thoughts of that person? That quality defines your connection. How does it first appear in speech? How do you talk to each other? The quality of that conversation first signifies your connection. It doesn't define it. It never finalizes it. Because usually a human connection starts with talking. And when it's really good, really fantastically harmonious, then there is silence. Silence without discomfort. Silence without misunderstanding. Silence without the gap of information. Connection starts with clarity. And based on that, any mistakes, any misunderstandings, any problems can be sorted out later. We practice kongans, Zen paradoxical stories, where you have to really enter a situation that happens somewhere, some other time, with some other people. It's a basic compassion exercise. How you can not imagine, but really become someone in that story and answer questions from that point of view. I give you an example. Zen Master Zhou Zhu, in Chinese, Chao Chou, he received a student. And the student says, Master, please teach me. Did you have breakfast? Yes, sir, I did. Then go, wash your bowls. The monk got enlightenment. Question, what kind of teaching did Zhou Zhu give to the monk? Second, what did the monk attain? Third, if you were the monk, what would you say to Joju after this? Do not despair. This is a kind of intermediate level Kongan. And if you get the beginner stage, then lower intermediate, middle intermediate, then you can get here and you can answer this correctly. But if you think, your thinking is short-circuited by the impossibility for your intellect. It's not your intellect that solves it. It's your clarity that solves it. It's not your small mind that is analyzing it to death and then there's a conclusion that you rejoice in. It's your great mind that perceives it unmoving. Okay? Clear like space, clear like a mirror. And then this perception works. So that's our lab test. The laboratory is Kongan practice. And you can make any amount of mistakes, no problem. Real Zen teacher always welcomes you back you can try again. No judges, no grudges. You can always try again. Why do we do that? Because in life, mistakes are costly. You cannot go back to the same time, same space, same person like yesterday. You cannot reverse the wheel of time. You make a mistake in life, sometimes you clean it up for years. Because even in this society, which seems very civilized, very much organized, pertaining to the rule of law, there is struggle and fight and rivalry and competition. In fact, the more refined it is, the more brutal it is, because you don't notice it. So everything seems to be so orderly. On the outside, yes. But as you try to dominate, as you try to be the best, as you try to control this struggle, this competition is there. It will always be there. Because we humans are fighting for supremacy, survival, for our own good, for our own right, etc., etc. This will never stop. It can be civilized, it can be well-trained and well-honed, or it can be brutal and uncivilized, etc., etc. Our choice. If we do the right thing and if we train ourselves, then this competition can harmonize into actually good relationship. When you call your competitor and congratulate whether you win or he or she wins, 
It's high class competition. Low class competition, you want to kill the other. Disable him or her, his or her group or country forever so that you would rule, you would dominate. I call that low class competition. Why? Because it perpetuates a cycle of revenge. So when you connect correctly, it's harmonious. When you connect incorrectly, it's disharmonious. When you connect correctly, it produces some kind of appeasement, satisfaction, sometimes even happiness. Sometimes, not always. When you connect incorrectly, it produces enmity, revenge, unjust pride, all kinds of delusions, and then the cycle becomes very much suffering. It produces a lot of suffering. That's how you know that it functions badly. Okay? So connections, relationships are essential. It's a meeting of minds, meeting of energies. Look at the result, the immediate result, midterm and long-term output. Does it produce happiness and harmony? Does it produce suffering, discontent, deprivation, poverty, depletion? You know something's wrong. Okay? And as a sideline, I can say that our situation on this earth is very interesting because it's neither determined to be good nor bad. This earth is our mirror. It reflects us human beings very well. We do our things right, this earth is paradise. We do our things wrong, this earth is hell. It's our choice, our decision. Nothing is predetermined, but we are born with some statistical probabilities. It's called our karma, our habits, our identity, our tendencies, our desire, our anger. That's our statistical probability, okay? We can transcend that. And if we transcend that, we can restructure that. And if you restructure that, you can transform that, sometimes even override that. Our choice. That's how connections and relationships are important. So usually when you start looking at it, you, the advice is like you have to do it alone, in a room, quiet, and so on, so on, so on. That's why I asked, and you said, no, first of no. all, you have to be with people to yeah. connect. And sometimes and so you do on. it in nature and not in a room. It's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. What's your so question? The question is, as a beginner, what is uh, the best way to start? You find a teacher, a good teaching, mm -hmm. and a student's group. We call that Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, the equivalent of this. If either of the three are missing, something is incomplete. Some people have a lot of ideas and they practice alone. They have some kind of imprint of the Dharma, but they have no teacher and no student's group. The two are missing. So in this case, people can go wrong because their solitary practice based on just books and learning can reinforce their own opinions. In fact, they can be more isolated than before. They can have more thinking than before. How do you know? Their relationships suffer. They have a very strong idea. Sometimes they practice, they have some energy, identify with some thought or emotion, it becomes worse than before. So correct teacher, teaching, and students group is necessary. Shop around. This part of the world has everything. I've just been to Shopping Street in The Hague. It's beautiful. You have all the brands. So with spiritual lineages, you also have all the brands. You have religions around if you want. You have meditation practices. They are not identical. Try them. Do you find a teacher you trust, a teaching you believe at first and want to try deeper, and a student's group where you are accepted and you can support that? These are questions to be explored. By now, you know me well enough that I'm not giving you definite answers to that. I respect your free choice much more. When you talked about the meditation, you said that uh, people can create hell on this earth or heaven. Uh, you said yes. that actually there can is do no that. good and bad. Yes. Uh, uh, do you relate uh, to the philosophy that through our inner reality we can create the extern external reality? Or I very much relate to that philosophy. In fact, I live it all the time. <laughs> if you keep your own mind clear, you create a clear universe around yourself, step by step, moment so, to moment. Mm -hmm. so, so we begin with ourselves. 
if we do not begin with ourselves, we have totally the wrong footing. Based on our unclarity, based on our illusions, based on our anger, desire, and ignorance, we cannot expect the world to change for the better. We have to begin with ourselves. You want to have a better world? Be that change inside. And then that change happens outside. OK? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Yes, yeah, so I understood that uh, through meditation, we can attain our true nature. Correct. So how is that through meditation, we can melt those layers of ice that we have built through the years, those illusions and all those misperceptions? H how does meditation help to melt those? When you layers? are aware of this moment, you are also aware of your projections onto this moment. And very quickly, you learn to distinguish between the actual perception of reality, the sound of the air con, the light of the ceiling lights, all of your faces, that's direct perception through my eyes and ears. And if I project anything onto that with my emotions and my thoughts, that's my thing. It has nothing to do with this situation. So learning to distinguish between that is a key factor. It comes actually very quickly, okay? And the rest, how you heat up the heart, is up to you to find out. Because Zen does not substitute the experience with the words. We never mean to substitute experience with words. But words are used to guide you correctly to the actual experience. And then you can see it for yourself. Okay? But it works, as I have said, at the very beginning stage. I can tell you with full trust and confidence, that's how it works. And the rest comes as you practice more. Can you attend that state without meditation? Does it no. happen? So? No, not me. That's the only I'm, a, path. I'm a very ordinary sentient being. I have to meditate for that. But are there, are there cases when people no. attend that state? No, even Buddha and Jesus, they practiced. I mean, meditative state, I understand. But is it necessarily due to, uh, during the meditation or can it uh, happen spontaneously? Uh, the, if the it happens spontaneously to people, then they practiced before. There's without, cause they, and effect very clear. Can it happen this practice without knowledge that you practice that? That being unaware of the practice, if you attain that? I think you want the easy way. <laughs> I think I got the easy way. <laughs> you got the easy way. Congratulations. <laughs> what I need you to understand is that we don't formalize people's lives, but if you want results, you have to put in some kind of energy. Even the law of thermodynamics, which seems to be very far from spirituality, it isn't. It says that if you want a heat increase in a given volume, you have to put energy into it. And if there was a decrease of heat, there was a dissipation of energy. But the mind is the same. You put in some kind of practice, clarity increases. And it can reach cruising altitude. You can stay up in the air, like we mentioned technology before. Uh, a hundred years ago, an aircraft was a very dangerous thing. Today, it still is, as we have seen. But the energy management of these aircrafts, they have progressed radically over the years. You needed a lot of fuel to reach higher altitudes. Now, we have uh, solar panels that can actually keep an aircraft up in the stratosphere for weeks. It's a big progress instead of just burning tons of fuels for a few seconds up in the stratosphere, and then you have to descend. That's a big difference, okay? So think about that, but there is no easy way here. This world is not famous for that. Um, how much meditation per day do you think is good? Like, I do 10 minutes a day, How and about I struggle. 20? Let's double yeah. it. Too much? I yeah. struggle. Me too. So how much struggle do you do? Struggle is good. It makes you stronger. So how, how much? How long okay, have I tell you, you been how doing much. it? And I, it's, it's really not difficult. 24 hours a day. <laughs> how about that? You cannot make it any better than that. Yes. Okay, 24 hours of awareness. When we ask this question, what is this? Actually, it has an extension. Whether you are sitting, standing, walking, lying down, talking, in silence, being a, awake, or in a dream, constantly, without interruption. What is this? This refers to this undifferentiated, clear state of mind, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. 
That's meditation. The rest is form. I meditated on the aircraft. It was called space. How the aircraft moves through space with me and some 200 people in it. That was wonderful meditation because you can't sleep. These modern aircraft, you can't recline the seat, so you can't sleep. So if you cannot sleep, you meditate. That's very good. So be aware, keep your mind's presence and clarity at all times. But like I've said before, if you don't meditate formally, you don't know what it is. So first you have to meditate somewhere, sometime, invest in it somehow. And if you do, then you have a good experience what kind of mind to keep through 24 hours a day. But it takes practice. It takes some investment. We are in Holland, come on. If those little tulips, okay, did not come to Holland and this great stock exchange did not open in the 17th century, Holland would not have acquired such financial power that you could beat Spain. And everything depended on these little tulips. So investment in them was, sounded like crazy. But investing in them was a good thing. So investing in Zen sometimes seems futile because you like sit like this for half an hour, 20 minutes a day, and seemingly nothing happens. Yet something happens. Your mind becomes stronger, clearer, more perceptive, more adaptive. You attain these qualities. But no investment, no profit. That's why I'm doing this right now. I believe that I'm helping you with this. And I don't take your freedom. I don't take your responsibility. I'm not telling you who you are, but I help you attain that. I help you by answering your questions and leading you to the edge of the experience where you can do it by yourself or not. It's your choice. Because only experience should convince you. My words can inform you, but only your experience should convince you. So if today's Dharma gathering helped you do that, then I feel very happy. And it's my true job satisfaction. I want to thank you all for your precious attention and hope that tomorrow's workshop will be useful for those who attend. And I humbly and kindly ask for your donations to help our temple and our community help other beings on this planet attain clarity, our true nature, and all the qualities that are related to this. Thank you very much.